Out the Bayou is presented by Community Coffee. Taste the difference family makes. The Oyster. You know, I really always wanted to meet the first person to crack open one of these and how hungry that person must have been to have said, hmm, now that looks good. We're in downtown Baton Rouge in front of Joe Lee Pearl, one of Baton Rouge's favorite oyster bars. This is just the midway point in the life cycle of a Louisiana oyster. It's a valuable commodity to the nation as a food source, as well as an invaluable asset to our coast here in the Bayou State. The demand is so high that science has now stepped in to help with Mother Nature's supply and an even better tasting crustacean. Mm. I grew up in the outdoors of Louisiana, with a fishing pole in one hand and a camera in the other. One I used to feed my family, the other I used to feed my passion. Look at the size of that. Just like that. My dad always said I could tell a good story, and for 25 years that has been my focus. True tales of real people with a flavor that only comes from straight out the bayou. Stories with great taste. Grand Isle, Louisiana. A great fishing town, but just over the bridge at Caminata Pass, if you look off to the left, you will see where science is now helping grow oysters, and the results are seriously mouthwatering. This is the purple one. Let's see if it tastes mm. any different than the other one. I'm hungry, so I'm going to have another one. Mm. I may have to have one or two more just to see if the taste differentiates any between <laughs> the purple shells and the white shell ones. Best tasting oyster in North America, right here. Steve Pollock and his wife Ginger were biology professors at LSU until they started to dabble in a new way to grow oysters. This was set up by the Port Commission of Grand Isle. Mm -hmm. It's a 25 acre plot with eight two acre individual plots in it. Okay. We actually saw an article in the newspaper down in Grand Isle about two or three Christmases ago and my wife said, looks like a good idea, we should do this. And so it's her fault. The idea was simple, take an oyster off the bottom where it spent a lot of its time filtering through the silt and grow it in a floating basket which places the oyster in an optimal feeding position within the water column. Well, keeping them up at the surface, obviously they're not in the muddy bottom for one, but they're also shaking in the waves. Right. And that helps shape the oyster to be rounder, deeper cut, and on the top surface they get a lot of oxygen. So they're never deprived of oxygen. You always get, you can see the water's green right here. Right. It's just loaded with algae. And so they get good water flow through them and they just, that's what they eat. They filter feed the algae out of the water. So their growth rates are pretty much as quick as they could ever be. Now who came up with this? Uh, the hatchery owner or manager, John uh, Supang, yeah. uh, knew this was going on in different places in the United States, especially okay. on the East Coast. Alabama's got a much bigger group of farmers that do just this. Right. And so he had to go to the state of Louisiana and uh, change the law to allow us to cage oysters, which is a, a wild right. life product. And, uh, and put them in these floating cages. So this was actually at first an experimental uh, setup, but now it's a completely commercial endeavor for the people that are involved. Add to that equation something the professors of biology call a triploid oyster. These oysters are what we would term a triploid or spawnless oyster. Mm -hmm. So these are oysters that instead of having two copies of each chromosome, they actually have three. And because of that, when they actually try to mate, uh, they, they can't, they're they like can't. a, like when you breed a horse and a donkey together, right. you, get, you get a mule and it's sterile. That's, that's kind of what these oysters are. Same species, but they don't make uh, the milky, watery appearance right. in the months that don't end with the letter R and they stay fat and juicy all year all long. Around. So they don't waste time with boyfriends and girlfriends. They just sit on the couch and get fat. Right. And, and people, people really appreciate it, especially in the summertime. Fat and happy oysters, baby. I love it. <laughs> that might be a new eight. You, you do triple happy. in, I'll do fat and happy. And, sounds good. You let you me know. know how many you need. <laughs> Mother Nature does not produce three chromosome oysters, so Steve has to buy them as farmers have to buy seed. The seed farm that designs these triploids resides on the coast of Alabama at the University of Auburn Research Center. And we can, we can do those manipulations at the time that we fertilize the eggs. It gets even more complicated because to, to make a triploid, you've got to have a tetraploid. Right. Uh, so a, a, your normal oyster has two sets of chromosomes. 
you've got a tetraploid oyster that through some scientific methods you make right. that has four sets of chromosomes and you cross those and come up with one that has three sets. Makes perfect sense. And that, to me. that triploid oyster is, is relatively sterile. Somewhere between PhD and a second grader lies a gray area that a TV guy like myself can understand about oyster reproduction. A warm bath can do wonders. The adult oysters get put into these containers and we manipulate temperature on it. We'll start them with some cool water and then we will we'll flood the system with much warmer water. That warmer temperature kind of triggers them into thinking it's springtime and it's time to spawn. There are about 40 super females, as I call them, doing 100% of the reproduction at this facility. Exhausting, right? Not really. Each can produce billions of eggs per year. Those particles in the water, that's not silt. Those are all young oysters searching for one thing, one single particle of substrate to latch onto. So we set them in a way that, that we're producing single oyster seed and then we can give those to farmers who raise them in baskets and, and bags off bottom. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're raising a premium product for the half shell market. Not only does the Auburn Research Center grow a now famous triploid oyster, but they also produce normal two chromosome oysters that many coastal states buy to supplement their stock. We're really just taking oysters from the wild. We're just maximizing their survival here in the hatchery. We just give them the oxygen they need, make sure they have enough food once you do that, you can use that for a lot of different tools. It could be for restoration, get a reef back there and not harvest it. It could be for on-bottom farming where you're putting oysters on the bottom either for a fishery or for a lease where people are going to go get them off the bottom. Then there's this idea of this off-bottom farming where you put them in some type of basket and get them up off the bottom and protecting them from predators. We can produce a beautiful oyster this way and you can get farms along the Gulf Coast where we've got folks who can work jobs and, and make a living at it. But I, I want to emphasize, the off-bottom oyster farms will never grow enough oysters to compete with what we grow on the bottom. Each baby oyster runs about a penny in cost, and there is only one way to count them. Sarah here, she takes subsamples out of that bucket, and she counts how many larvae are in a milliliter of that water. So then we can use that to estimate how many is in the total bucket. Back to Grand Isle and Steve's Triple N Farm and more importantly, the labor required to raise oysters off the bottom. I've been feeling like my whole life I've been going in circles. You know, Steve? <laughs> and now you've just oh, proved yeah. it. That, that was be, just training. You'll be feeling it in a couple minutes. That was just training. <laughs> you'll start it. getting dizzy. Three to four times a week, Steve makes this two and a half hour drive from Baton Rouge to flip cages. Repair cages that wave action will damage, move growing oysters to larger baskets, and harvest those that are ready for market. But wait, there is more. Clean them, box them, refrigerate them, and drive them back to Baton Rouge to personally deliver to Jolie Pearl. Adding up the time investment, equipment, and even at a premium price, these premium oysters are a work of passion, not profit. What they bring to the table, so to speak, is an oyster that is stronger in its resistance to disease. It doesn't concern itself with dating or family life, so eating, growing, and getting fat is a life well lived. I sure love me some more oysters. <laughs> Taste-wise, you will get hooked quickly, even if you're like my photographer, Robin, who had never eaten a raw oyster. But Robin you you chew it. You have to has chew it. never, ever eaten a raw oyster. Here we're gonna go. That's not big. And look, chew it now. Don't just swallow it like a baby. Oh, you gotta baby. chew it? Yeah, you taste it. You taste it and you chew it. a girl! It's not bad, is it? It's not bad. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, go. See? No fear. Well, except maybe jumping out of a boat and not knowing if there is a bottom. Oh, that's right. You can't swim. 80% of the state covered in water, and I find the only Shalmatian that can't swim. When we come back, where do all of these oysters go? And is the plate the last stop?